So here's the cable goes in J3. Let's notice this. Look, I was just going to go and test the, the connections. See the very end pin there? The pin's actually pulling out. It may not have actually been making a connection. It's pulled really tight. It's actually not pushed into the housing like it should be. It's sticking out the back a little bit. See, there it is. That could be a problem. Whether that's from me moving things around or not, I'm not sure. But it's just pulling straight back out. The little retaining pin needs to be pushed in place. Maybe someone's been probing it and they've dislodged it because they've been probing it. I don't know, but that's not right. That doesn't help. Could even be that. It goes to the right place. Well, let's check across all the pins after reinserting that one. And there's no shorts across any of the pins. I've checked every pin across every other pin and all these pins, no shorts. And those, that's the only ball that goes to the positive module. Now, there is one that goes to the negative module as well. Maybe I should check between the negative and the positive as well, just in case there's a short between the negative and the positive, because there's a link between the two. So I might just do that as well, just to be sure. Well, I checked across both of those. There's no shorts at all between any of those pins. There's a couple of little blips where there's obviously a, a connection, but there's no actual shorts. Now, one thing I did notice when I was looking at this J3 connector is that on the manuals, it mentions pin 12 as having a connection. Well, there's no pin 12 in there. There is no wire. And if I look at the board here, there's a trace going to pin 12. This is pin 12 over here. So I'm not sure what's going on there. It's like there should be a connection, but there isn't one. So it is a bit strange to wait on a circuit diagrams on a board. It seems to show a pin 12 usage. But there is also a diagram that shows the actual wiring for these. I'm just looking at that now, and I think it's okay. But a quick glance shows nothing pin 12 at least. But I'm just going to verify the others are correct as well. Well, all that stuff seems to check out, so that's looking all right. I've got to replace this fuse. The fuse is right here. It's a bit of an unusual one. It's this block here standing up on the board. That's it there. Never seen one like before. I do have some fuses, I can probably just replace it and hopefully be all right. But yes, it's odd that's blowing because I can't see any reason for it blowing. At least not yet. Well, I've realized what's going on with this fuse now. I just had a closer look at it. And notice on this, it says 150 degrees C. It's a thermal fuse, which is against this resistor. So obviously it's there to protect if this resistor starts getting too hot and potentially burning out. So it's got a thermal fuse, which has failed. I will have to look. I might have some thermal fuses. I don't know if I've got one that's the right size or the right value, I have to check. So the only thermal fuse I can find which is close to suitable is 157 degrees, that's so slightly warmer, 7 degrees hotter. It's rated at 10 amps. don't think the current rating matters. I'm not sure, I've not really done much with thermal fuses. It's the only reason I've even got these fuses is because I've used these sorts of things to repair oil heaters before. You get these little freestanding oil heaters, not these small things, you know. And they have these thermal fuses in them. And sometimes they blow, usually from children, crank it right up and leave it up and it overheats and it blows this thermal fuse. Be a bit careful about soldering them, otherwise you end up blowing the fuse. So I've got to kind of put it on like a standoff as well, but like the existing one is. Got these ceramics around here, so I'll, I'll do the same on those. I'm actually tempted to put a 2.5 amp fuse in series with it. I'm just tempted to do that because it is a 2.5 amp fuse at least then i've got a 2.5 amp fuse and a thermal fuse uh, i don't know i might just do a thermal fuse and see if we go but if you think i'm wrong please tell me it's easy enough to revisit this anyway so i'm going to pop this out wait for my solder line to warm up so i'm chatting away then we'll pop this one in and that should restore it i think i think that'll make it work and there's the fuse there i just forgot to record it of course <laughs> Anyway, there's a few. I'm going to recheck it. Let's be absolutely sure it definitely is blown. In case I'm tracing something which isn't actually there. Just want to be sure. I mean, I did test it in circuit, obviously, but let's test it again. Yep. Open circuit. Nothing there if I touch the probes. So, yep. Definitely gone. Actually, let's just check the new fuse just before, before I put the thing in there. Yep, that's sweet. So, now the fuse is good now. If it's no good when I put it in, then Either I've made a mistake when I've soldered it and got it too hot, or something's blown it. What I think I'll have to do is when I power this up as well is try and get the um, thermal camera out and I'll try and check it around here as well in case there is a problem. Maybe excess current draws causing this resistor to heat up. Or it could just be the fan was not running or the filter was clogged and there wasn't getting enough airflow so it wasn't keeping cool like it's supposed to. Entirely possible. Well, I seem to have a small problem. This doesn't want to pass through the PCB holes. It's basically the same size as the hole. Let's just try the other one. That's what I'm doing. It kind of doesn't really want to go through. It kind of goes in. Yeah, it's not great, is it? I might have to put some other little posts through here first and then solder it to the posts. I've reduced my soldering iron temperature to try and reduce the chance of actually causing a problem with melting the fuse. And I'm going to solder it with the tweezers holding onto it as well. This is all prepared, I've got those bent over, I'm going to just put that across there, strap like that, and I'll put some insulation across the whole thing as much as I can at least to try and uh, make it safer, because there's going to be potentially high voltages there. So we'll do that, and hopefully 
doesn't blow the fuse. The other thing I've also done is I've left the leads on, so I'm going to cut the lead off afterwards because that helps to heat sink it as well and take the heat away quicker. So now I've done one side, now I'll do the other side, which is a little bit closer, and it's more likely to be the one that's going to give him trouble. But uh, yes, anyway, I've got just enough solder on there too, so hopefully it's going to work. Really, these are supposed to be crimped, but I don't have a suitable terminal for this. Here we go, All right. Right, first test. Is it still conductive? It is, I haven't blown a fuse. Great. Let's cut these off, insulate it, and we'll put it back in. Right, there we go. That's heat shrinked. I'll just fold the ends over. Could have cut them the right length, but I just wanted to fold them over. A bit of double insulation, I suppose, from the edges we could touch them at. This though is connected to one side, so that is actually electrically connected to this, so there's not really much point, just don't touch that. <laughs> it does say don't touch anything because it's live, so hopefully that's still okay. Let's retest it. I like to use heat shrink, the uh, hot air to shrink the sleeving on. So we should still be alright, hopefully. Yes we are. Right, I think we can put this thing back together. Okay, moment of truth. I'm hooked up in preparation. Haven't powered up yet. All the plugs are back on. Board is definitely seated back in properly. Now we're either going to get magic smoke, a bang, or it's going to work. So power switch is currently off. Turn it on there. Turn this on. The neons are both lighting up okay. So it doesn't like a short. Let's do positive output, full scale, one volt, that's still working. 10 volts, that's still working. 100 volts, we've got 100 volts. It's working. You did it! It's working! It's working! Now, what I'm gonna do, get my thermal camera out before I do any more. I'm going to check for this getting hot in case there is a problem still. But we've at least got positive 100 volts now. Yes. Let's turn that on. We'll give it an output. 100 volts. Full range. We've got that. And let's see what's going on down here. I'm just looking for anything being excessively hot. We're getting about 73 degrees already. 75 maybe. On that resistor. Yeah, it's looking okay actually. Get about 70 degrees. 72 or 73 degrees seems to be where it's sitting at. That seems alright. Seems I've got the camera out, I might as well look, look, look around the board and see if I can see anything else going a bit wonky. But no, it's looking alright. Tune power supplies out down here. Anything reflective can cause problems with the actual readings as well. But no, it's looking kind of alright. There's nothing really standing out as being a problem. I'm getting about. 77 degrees there now. Uh, make it 85. 85 degrees there. So it does definitely get pretty hot that resistor. But then that is why I got a big resistor in there. So that's why the airflow is also quite important because I don't have the cover on right now. So the airflow will improve that situation. So okay, we'll put the cover on. So it sucks it around. So when the cover's on it will suck air through this region. That's what it's supposed to do. I put the cover on now. I'm confident it's not going to burn up. This is what main thing I was trying to check for. I mean, maybe someone's been running it without the cover on, and that's what's blown the fuse. I mean, it wasn't working when I got it, so it's obviously before I started fiddling around with it. But uh, all right, let's put it on. Do it again. 100 volts, positive output, full range. Great. So should I try 500 volts? Let's do that and do 1000 volts. Turn the output back on again. Uh, see, 1000 volts to range still not working. That's a shame. Yeah, so 1000 volts still got a problem. But that's okay, we've got some progress now. We've now got 100 volt range. Minus 100. And plus 100. So let's actually see 
if we can get the maximum range of 190 with a reasonable level. Oh, I'll put, have to confirm it. There you go. If you go above a certain threshold, which is considered a safety threshold, it doesn't increase the output anymore, you have to confirm it first. So that's completely normal. Yeah, another digit. Um, this seems to be pretty accurate. I just compared this thing before against my 10 volt reference. There you go, quiet again now. So I've got my PDVS2 Mini, which I got from Ian Johnson. If you don't have one, I recommend you get one. And that does an accurate 10 volts. And I put my, I've got my signal running up the top here, you can't see it, but my signal's running up there, and I can put that voltage on there, gave me a reading, and then I did the 10 volts on this thing, it gave me exactly the same reading. So the calibration on this looks good. Or at least it agrees with my PDVS2 Mini. That's a bonus. So I've now got up to 100 volts, well up to 199 volts working. Excellent. So now it's got to figure out the 1000 volt issue. Actually, let's check AC. Now I've got that working. See, we've got AC working now. Let's try that. So let's do AC. Positive waveform, 1 volt. We're getting 1.89, which is wrong. Oh, sorry, I'm on 1.9 here. There you go, 1 volt. Okay, so AC 1 volt is working. AC 10 volts is working. AC 100 volts. AC 100 volts is working. Excellent. Okay, so let's try 500 volts. Well, it's 50 volts right now. But let's do 1000 volt range and we'll see if that'll work. No, so AC isn't working either on a high voltage, so 1000 volt range isn't working, but it's fine, we're getting there. So I think I've got this thing basically done. I've replaced all the tantalums that which matter, I've checked all the circuit diagrams, every single board, and anything that's on a 15 volt rail and only had a 25 volt tantalum for example, I changed all of those. One board I did all the tantalums on anyway, but there's some boards only one on 5 volts and they got a 25 volt cap, so not likely to be an issue. Those will probably be fine for another 20 years or so. Those kinds of situations, I've left those alone. Anything which is borderline or could potentially be a problem, I've replaced. The only ones I haven't really done are those two big electrolytics in the back here in the power supply. I don't have those in stock right now. But they're on a 22 volt rail and a 25 volt caps. And all they're doing is smoothing, there's no regulation. So if you've got a high input voltage on the main line, then these could potentially go up to 25 volts input. I don't want to replace those at 25 volts, I want to put some 35s in there. But everything else is done, every other tantalum which I think needs replacing has been replaced. I've done quite a few, there's like a pile of maybe, I don't know, 30 or so, something like that. Quite a few, maybe more than that. And every electrolytic has been replaced apart from say those two there. I basically have it working. But I've just replaced those tantalums, so I want to power it up now on camera in case I've made a mistake and blown something up or shorted out some pads or something like that. Right? So I want to power it up now after replacing those final tantalums. I spent a couple of hours doing that. Have a display. No signs of any bangs, that's good. Output on, DC, let's do one volt, full scale. One volt, that is working. 10 volts, that is working. 100 volts, that is working. The 1000 volt range I've got working as well. I found out what that was. There's a switch on this board over here, on the power amplifier board, just down here by the latch, and that disables the 1000 volt range. Either it was off when I got it, or I knocked it when I'd been moving the boards around or something like that, and that was turned off. And so that disables the 1000 volt range, I guess that's a safety thing. I didn't actually know which way it's supposed to go, there's no markings, but there is a marking now, I've got my own pen. And that is now turned on 1000 volt range, which should now work. Although it's going to say no, because it's, you know, unsafe. It should be down to say 500, or oh, do 400, that'll do. Turn it on from there. 400 volts. The beeping is kind of annoying. Yeah, I can understand why. The negative supply is also working. AC, let's do AC. Let's do 100 volts. Let's do 40 volts AC first. Turn it on. Go to AC on the meter so we can see what's going on. There you go. AC, it will get there, it's settling, obviously. 1 kilohertz, that's what it's saying. 
which is correct. If I do 10 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. I don't know what this meter goes up to, I don't remember. 100 kilohertz, that's there, I can read that. One megahertz, not that voltage, I think. Um, 100 hertz, 100 hertz. So all the frequencies are working correctly, that's good. So I got it to uh, 1 kilohertz again. I would like to go back to 1 kilohertz again. Why well, let me go back to 1 kilohertz? Maybe that switch is a bit dodgy. I'm still doing it now. Yeah, might be a dirty switch. 1 kilohertz, 40 volts. This go to 400 volts. It's going to turn off and beep at me when I turn it on. Okay, 400 volts AC. It's all working. Excellent. I'm really happy with that. What I'm going to do now, I'm just going to, I'll put the cover on. I just wanted to make sure there's no smoke coming out of it and in case things get overheated on this ball because it does rely on airflow. So I'm going to put this cover back on, just sit it on top and then we'll go through some of these other things and show you some of the other functions. So now let's look at resistance. Let's see if that's working. We'll see what it's actually doing. Let's do resistance on here. Lowest range, zero. And that's our base reading here on two wire. I'm not using four wire right now. So I might just delta that. This isn't a particularly accurate meter. It's okay, but it's not super accurate. Obviously, if I'm gonna do proper checks, I'm gonna use my decent meters for this, my high-end ones. Mind you, this is a fairly expensive meter. But um, let's go through each one, says zero. Make sure, zero, yep. Okay, we all say zero, that's good. Let's back down to this end. I'm gonna do full scale. This is 10.42 ohms. So 10.06, so accuracy of this thing. Yeah. Okay. So 100 ohms, again 0.42. Now this has got a, I think it's got an offset in here for the remote sensing. No, I can't do that when it's already on. So I think it's offsetting remote sensing stuff. So maybe if I turn that delta back off again. I turn the delta back off again, it's actually pretty close. So, 1K. 10K. Just bang on that one. 100K. Yep, not bad. So one meg. Yeah, if I'm moving around, it's causing interference. So it's fits in the one meg range if I'm moving around near it. So if I'm not moving, it's fine. If I start moving, it's showing up. So it's fine. It's not the unit. It's my proximity to it. 10 meg. It's doing 10 meg. That'll be the same deal with the movement affecting the readings. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? And 100 meg, this thing I might read. Can't do that. But so resistance is working. That's good. Right, let's chest current now. So I've got a, my meter now hooked up in milliamp range onto the current terminals. I've got it set to 100 microamps and we're getting something very close to that. So we've got to one milliamp. Yep, we're getting about that. 10 milliamps. We're getting 10 milliamps. What's this maximum range on this? Uh, 0.6 amps fused. So 100 milliamps, that's fine. One amp, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> As you can see, it's adjustable. Let's do 500. One amp range, so we're doing 500 milliamps. Yep, that's working too. Excellent. It's only got a one amp range anyway, so it goes up to 1.99 amps anyway. So two amps is the maximum it can output, which is fine for doing testing, I suppose. Maybe not so much for doing calibrations. A lot of muscle meters like this, we got 10 amp range. Maybe to calibrate a 10 amps, in which case you have to find another method of doing it. Everything is working. I actually bloody fixed it. That was quite a gamble. That was a very expensive gamble, and I'm really glad it paid off.